safe in you, Jesus. We will abide in you, Lord, hide in you, Lord, rest in you. Teach us to wait on you. Strength in 
for your peace, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're ministering peace right now, Lord God, and we just release your peace, Lord God. Peace in the storm. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the true vine. Thank you, Lord God, that we can draw strength from you, Lord. And I ask, Lord Jesus, for those who need to draw strength, Lord God, I ask, Lord God, that you would renew our strength, Lord God. Your word says those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength, Lord God. You give us strength, Lord God. You give us strength, Lord God. And so I ask for a supernatural strength today, Lord God, a supernatural strength. Lord God, as we face tomorrow as we face lord god the rest of the week i ask lord jesus for supernatural strength thank you lord jesus amen every nation rosebank i am delighted to be with you we're starting a brand new series it's called the year of yes it's about us saying yes to jesus and above all us saying yes to joy this is what Jesus brings. He brings us life and he brings us joy. And we're going to look at the book of Philippians, an incredible book. Now, there's a big difference between happiness and joy. So happiness is when you, when you feel the sun shine on your face. Happiness is when you find 200 rand. Happiness is when you smell the coffee. Happiness is when you get freshly baked bread. Happiness is when you pop those, you know those bubble wrap things? That's happiness. But what happens when the coffee gets cold? What happens when the sun sets? What happens when the bread gets stale? And what happens when, when there's no more bubble wrap to pop? There is joy that comes from Jesus, that comes straight from him, that transcends, that is above, that is beyond just our experiences. It's above our external realities. It's something that comes from him. And we're going to talk about joy today. Philippians, this book, is really a guide to joy. And we're going to help you memorize it's a short book, 104 verses, and, and you can read it in maybe 15 minutes. And it has got some of the best verses in the Bible, and it's got my wife Nicola's favorite verse. I can do all things through him who gives me strength, Philippians chapter 4. Another one, Philippians 2, talking about Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude or the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Another one, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And then you can see I'm a blessed man. This is my wife's favorite verse. It's whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's Philippians 4 verse 8. Now the big theme of Philippians is joy. And I'll give you a couple of verses just to give you a sense of how it's transcendent. Because it's 19 times Joy is mentioned, and about 60 times Jesus is mentioned, and that's why they go together. He writes, my prayer with joy, in verse 4 of chapter 1. Verse 18, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Verse 25, joy in the faith. In chapter 2, complete my joy. Verse 17, I am glad and rejoice. In verse 28, rejoice at seeing him again, embrace him. And then finally, chapter 3, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And in chapter 4, he says, my brothers, my joy and my crown. And then lastly, 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So there's this theme. And, and what is so interesting is this was written by Paul in jail. This was written when his circumstances were difficult. This was written by Paul during lockdown. And the Philippian church, I believe, is a whole lot like the Rosebank church, that you are a place of joy and of life. Written by Paul in AD 60, he had founded this church about 10 years before. He had heard the call to go into Europe. The gospel had gone into Africa. The gospel had gone into Asia. And then they have that Macedonian call. And Paul concludes. And they go across. And they arrive and they find these women praying. Lydia, she was the Gucci saleswoman of those days. She was a seller of purple. And she was upper class. And uh, then they engage with, with a slave girl who's demon possessed. And she's really the most oppressed class. And they end up in jail, and uh, they lead the jailer to the Lord, and he's kind of the blue-collar worker. And, and so this church, like every nation, Rosebank, was a church of, of every tribe and tongue, as well as being people from, from different socioeconomic groups. And um, I'm going to take you now to Scripture. So why don't you just open up your hearts, and if you want to open up your Bibles, we're going to go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, verse 1 through to 12. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, 
to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who's begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, full of the fruits of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And then last verse, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Philippians is probably the best church in the New Testament. Corinthians, bit of a crazy church, great church, bit of a crazy church. Paul's writing to correct them. Galatians, similarly, go a bit off the rails. Paul writes, and he doesn't describe himself as an apostle. Most times he does. Simple reason is they already receive him. They already receive his gift. And, and you know this, parents, the only time you have to say to your child, who's the parent here, is when they don't respect the org, the org chart. But when people receive you, when they they see the value in you. When they respect you, you don't need to say that. So Paul doesn't do that in this particular church. Paul's words are tender. He says, I thank God. I remember you give me joy. Beautiful words, love and joy and gratitude. And, and Paul and Timothy, their description of themselves, it's so profound. They describe themselves as servants. Now, as we go to the book of Isaiah, from Isaiah 40 all the way through to about 55, we've got someone described as the servant. And this someone that, that Isaiah is prophetically speaking of is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the one who came to serve. And it's radically countercultural to this, to this world that we're in now where it's all about what people do for us and us standing on our rights. Jesus, our God, our Savior, our Lord, he came to serve. And, and so Paul and Timothy adopt the same stance. And for them, they see Jesus serving, and they see Jesus having joy in serving, and so too, Paul and Timothy, they have joy in serving. And this is the first secret, point one, if you're looking for a three-point sermon. There is a great joy that comes from serving our Lord Jesus Christ and from serving the church. There is a joy in serving. We serve a God who served us, Jesus talks about, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And, and Jesus is God who was willing to humble himself and to serve, and he did it with joy. Verse 5, it talks about, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just Paul and Timothy, but it was the whole of the Philippians. All of them were laboring. All of them had a joy in service. Now, a dispute arose amongst the disciples in Luke 22. And their argument, read from verse 24, it says they argued about who was the greatest amongst them. And Jesus responds and he says, you know, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over one another and they have authority, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest amongst you be the youngest and the leader as the one who serves for who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? And then Jesus said, but I am the one who serves in your midst. Now, to serve requires fresh revelation. It requires fresh perspective. And it requires humility. And, and we serve because he's first served us. Another verse, Matthew 20, verse 58 Whoever would be great amongst you must be a servant, even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So the Philippians have got this joy, 
and their joy is found in serving. Paul and Timothy have got a joy in serving. Our Lord Jesus Christ served with joy. And, and you know, joy is given and joy is received as we serve. You know, if you read the Old Testament, it talks about the different types of offerings. And the first kind is a burnt offering. And, and sometimes when you first start serving, it feels like a burnt offering. It just goes up in smoke. Could apply to your giving as well. The second kind of offering was a little bit was burnt but the priest ate from it. And sometimes as we grow in maturity, we start to say, okay, so I didn't get much out of that, but a whole lot of people were blessed. So I'm glad that they're eating. As we mature in our service, we get to a place where that sacrifice that we bring of, of service or finances, whatever it is, we get to partake in it. And that was the fellowship offering where the priest would take it, they would burn just a little bit of the fat and they'd give it back to you and you'd enjoy that bra place. You would enjoy that meat. And that's the way service is meant to be. And I'm going to call a dear friend of mine. He heads up our Every Nation Johannesburg CRT crisis response team. Great businessman, great man of God. And Brian, thank you for what you do for the kingdom. Just share a little bit about your service and, and what God has spoken to you lately about serving. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, Pastor Roger. I, I hope most of us are familiar with the CRT project that we ran last year based here in Rosebank. In the midst of the hard lockdown and COVID-19 for about six months, we were involved in an incredible project. The project reached on a weekly basis around 200 households, sometimes between one to 2,000 people that were supplied with food and other, other needs. We looked after the needs of our own brothers and sisters in fellowship, but we also were able to welcome strangers in and to serve and meet their needs in the scope of the project. Combined with the ministry team and the mission teams, we were able to minister in the parking lot one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. People got saved, people got baptized, uh, people got baptized in the spirit, people got discipled, and they're still being discipled today. It was a phenomenal project. It involved a lot. It was six days a week. We were busy. We were all volunteers, a team of about 200, and we had no planning or scope or anything. We just responded to the need. Now, my testimony today is not about that fantastic outcome, but it's about the unexpected miracle of that season. And for me, there was a very real unexpected miracle. Um, just imagine running this, a project of that scope under those circumstances with no planning or preparation, no budget, a staff of one, people who, un, who are unqualified, who aren't used to working together. Imagine running that in your workplace and imagine the effects that would have on you, on your team, on your family, on your health, on your stress, on your personality, on your time. And this wasn't the case. And that was the unexpected miracle. The miracle for me was discovering that I'm partnering with the Holy Spirit. I'm partnering with the creator of heaven and earth. The creator of the universe has called me up and given me a task to do and equipping me to do this task and not only leaving me to do it, but was walks, walking alongside me on a daily basis, on an hourly and minute by minute basis. There were so many unexpected, complicated problems that arose in that short space of time. And there were so many simple, brilliant, creative solutions that just presented themselves. God's providential solutions were all around us. His hand was moving and working. And for me, it was completely unexpected. I was prepared to do the work and I was prepared to grudge it out for the sake of what I was called to do, accept my responsibility. What I wasn't prepared for is what God was doing in me. I wasn't prepared for this freshness in my relationship. I wasn't prepared to discover how easy it was to hear the Holy Spirit and the guidance in that season. And it was sweet and it was wonderful, but it was also permanent and extending. My family, Tetiana and the boys, were also involved. And we would come and, and, and work together on our days. And the effect that it had in our family, we weren't prepared for. You know, our boys, uh, age nine and seven at the time, we try and teach them about the world and prepare them, but we do grow up in a little bubble of privilege. That's the culture and the lifestyle that we're in. Nothing burst that bubble like this experience. And you know, to this day, their prayer life has forever been altered. We saw 
instantly, as soon as they understood the need and they saw the work of the Holy Spirit around them with other families and children co-laboring, instantly something changed in the power behind their prayers, in the, in the discernment of the needs around them. And it, was, it really, really was miraculous. For me, that season of serving was something that was unexpected, but it was, I guess the best phrase is a sweet spot. It was my sweet spot in that time. And God, by his grace, allowed me to enter in and co-labor with him. I couldn't have sought it out. I couldn't have pursued it. I just needed to respond when he gave me the opportunity. And wow, I don't regret it. You know, the, the consequences are ongoing um, in my life, in my own family's life. The expansion in our ministry um, is evident. And I guess our faith, our levels of faith and assurance that God is in control and that the things that he brings and, and gives us to do, uh, he is there behind us to equip them. And since then, we've gone on to see God use us mightily in completely different ways um, in, an area, in a way that we would have been reticent to even get involved in the past. But because of the, just the anointing and the learning that we had in that season of serving, the joy and the sweet, sweet, sweetness of partnering with the Holy Spirit of God, our perspective has been changed. And um, Rog, awesome. yeah, if that wraps it up, be renewed. Brian, I love how you described the sweet spot. And for each of us, friends, there is a sweet spot. There are sweet spots for you where you can serve, where you can find joy in being the man, being the woman that you're called to be. Jesus spoke in John 4, verse 34. He said, my food is to do the will of God. And sometimes we are afraid to be used by God. We think that we will end up depleted. But that's unbiblical. The truth is that as we serve, as we do the will of God, we find sustenance, we find strength. And Brian's testimony, thank you, Brian, is just such an evidence of it that there is a sweet spot for every one of us to serve and to honor him. Next secret that I want to talk about is the joy of the gospel. Paul and Timothy address these believers in Philippi, and they call them saints. And saints literally means those who are holy. Now, I went to a Catholic school, and look, there's lots of Catholics who love Jesus and serve Jesus, and we'll see lots of Catholics in heaven. But this is what Catholics describe as a saint. They say it's someone who has to be Catholic, and you have to die, and a local like following develops around you, and then your life has to be investigated. Um, you have what is called the devil's advocate that tries to un un unravel your life, and the local bishop has to put a letter to the Vatican, and they have to pray for a miracle to be done in your name, and the Vatican investigates the miracle, and then they declare you to be blessed. That's like kind of step one, and then they pray for another miracle, and if it comes, then they can approve you, and you become known as a saint. Now, they can then have a holiday named after you, or schools or churches, you know, St. Brian, St. Ashley, St. Grace, whatever it is. But this is the truth. It's actually a one-step process, and it's found in Jesus Christ. It's found in what Jesus has done. Jesus, by his grace, makes us into a saint. Only possibly three times in the New Testament does the Bible refer to Christians as sinners, and zero times in Philippians. It's maybe 200 times in the New Testament where we are described as other things, like righteous, like holy, like saints. And so sin might describe some of your activity, but it doesn't define your identity in Christ Jesus. And, and you may sin some of the time, but you are a saint all the time. And I want to tell you a story. It's a Christian allegory, and I heard it from my son James. I dialed into one of our church plants, Every Nation City Bowl, and he told this story. And it's important that you take hold of it. So imagine you in a, in a dungeon, in a dark castle, kind of like Lord of the Rings, Mordor kind of thing. And you're in this darkest dungeon, and you're surrounded by the most terrible criminals. And, and the worst thing is, they are rapists and murderers, and they've done terrible things, but they're your compatriots. You've done things with them, and, and so you deserve to be there. 
and they've turned on you, and, and there's a cage in the middle of this dungeon. The dungeon is filthy, and there are snakes and scorpions, and, and there's a cage in the middle, and, and you in that cage. And, and your skin is just broken, covered in shingles and sores, and, and your bones are broken, and, and you just long for death. You just wish you could die, and, and your ex-compatriots, they are torturing you from the outside. All of a sudden, there's a bang and a crash, and the doors break open, and a massive shaft of light comes through, and in marches victorious this prince and his soldiers of a different kingdom. And everybody scuttles for the, co the corners in fear. And, and you hide away in the corner of the cage, but you can't really hide. And, and this prince comes towards the cage and he, and he breaks the lock and he opens the door and he, and he reaches for you and you're afraid. And this is so foreign to you, the, the light and the cleanliness and the power and the glory. And, and he gently takes you out and he pulls you to himself. And, and, and it's so strange, somebody touching you and loving you. And then he passes you to one of his lieutenants and he says, take him to my castle. And then the prince climbs into the cage. And the cage is locked. And all of a sudden, you see that this prince is starting to develop boils and sores and, and things on his skin. And as it develops on his skin, it starts to disappear off yours. And you hear his bones start to break and crack. At the same time, your bones just start to align. And so he's left broken, covered in sores, and, and tortured in this cave, in, cage, sorry, and, and you are taken away, and you're taken away to his palace, and you are washed, and you are fed, and you are cleansed, and you are healed, and you get to sleep, and, and you're restored. Days later, this prince returns, and he's still got the scars that you used to have on him, but he's whole. What is your response to him? Your response is, is one of love. Your response is one of gratitude. You're not fixating on, on what you were, but your heart is one of, thank you, Prince. Thank you, Lord, for saving, us, for saving me, for coming in and taking me out of that cage, taking me out of that darkness. And we need to see it this way. Jesus has paid the price. We have been made saints because of what he has done. And sin might be some of what you do sometimes, but the totality of who you are is found in Christ Jesus. We have a new identity and we can have victory because Jesus has come in. Jesus has rent the temple. Jesus has broken our chains. We are no longer in cages. We have the joy of walking with him in his kingdom and being set free. We are saints. This is our identity. This is the new identity that we are called to live with and walk in. As a sinner, you may have a dark past, but as a saint, we've got something else, and that is the most marvelous, bright future. The old is gone, the new has come. And Paul writes to the Philippians, and he calls them saints, and I wanna speak it over you. You are a saint, you have been made holy. You are set apart. Don't dwell in your past, don't dwell in your sin, but dwell in the richness of what Jesus has, his forgiveness and his love for you. Verse six. Paul writes, he says, I'm sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And God has begun a good work in you. And won't you just continue to allow him to, to be faithful and good for you, in you, and through you. For you, he's finished his work, it's inside of you. In you, more love, more grace, more of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, more and more of a transformed life, never the same, becoming more and more Christ-like. And through you, that you would touch people's lives because of him touching you. I want to talk to you about one more secret. And that is the secret, the joy of seeing the kingdom advance. Paul writes about this in verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. What is he talking about? The fact that he's been put in jail, the fact that he's in lockdown, the fact that he's shackled next to one of these elite soldiers of the Roman Praetorian Guard. Paul has got a different perspective. His joy is in seeing kingdom advance. He's not concerned about building his empire, his business, 
his reputation, his Instagram following. What his passion is, is to see the kingdom advance. So in the midst of, of him being in a difficult place, being locked down, his passion and his heart is to see the kingdom advance. You know, when I wake up and go for my runs in the morning with the secular running crew, I have an excitement. I have an excitement that today I'm going to speak to somebody. I don't know who, but the kingdom is going to advance. I'm going to pray for somebody. Maybe I'm going to lead somebody to the Lord. And, and we need to change the orientation of our life as to what is success and, and what is advance and, and what is important to us. May the things that are beating on Jesus' heart, the things that are a joy for him, become a joy for you and for me, that we see joy in kingdom advance. We need purpose bigger than our pain. We need purpose bigger than our problems. And you know what? Jesus is so much bigger, so much stronger, and so much more important than, than any pain or any problem. And may God help you in this season if you're in pain and problems. But I want to say to you, be caught up in the vision of his kingdom. Because this life is just, it's just an interlude. This is just an audition. This is just a moment. This is a light and momentary affliction compared to what awaits us. So can we burn to see people come to Jesus? In Philemon verse 6, he writes, I pray that you would be active in sharing your faith so that we would have a full understanding of every good thing you have in Christ. I'll say that again. Paul says, I pray that you would be active in sharing your faith so that you would have a full understanding of every good thing you have in Christ. So the, the flip side of this is if you're not sharing your faith, you won't be living with that revelation. You won't be living with that understanding of every good thing that you have in Christ. Now, either Paul was crazy, either he was mental, which he wasn't, or he was supernatural. And that's the case. He had a joy to see the kingdom come. He transcended the situation, and that is the joy that Jesus brings. There is a joy in service. There is a joy in us being saints. It's about the gospel. It's about what Jesus has done. And it talks about in Luke chapter 10 that Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy. And if you're in a place of, of, of depression, of sadness, of difficulty, I want to say to you, Jesus wants to touch you. Jesus wants to give you joy. And some of it you're going to find in service. Like Brian, you'll be surprised by it. Some of it you're going to find in just realizing that you've been taken out of darkness. And some of it is you being part of something so much bigger, seeing his kingdom come and his kingdom advance. Last thought. You know, kids laugh about 400 times a day. Different cultures are slightly different, um, qu quite different. And adults laugh about 20 times a day. So can we be a bit more like little children? And not just laugh because we're drinking laughing gas or something like that, but can we find the joy that comes from Jesus? I'm going to lead us in a prayer now. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, we bring our emotions, our troubles, our trials and our afflictions, and Lord, we put them at your feet, and we pray for fresh perspective. We pray for a revelation that joy is found in serving you. Lord, for those who have, who have served and, and felt burnt out, I pray you'd heal them. I pray you'd restore them. I pray that there'd be a freshness in them to, to serve and to give again. Lord, for all of us, I pray that we would have the joy of being saints, having our sins forgiven, having been taken out of darkness, out of cages, out of dungeons, into your glorious light. And Father God, I pray for a joy in every one of us, a joy of seeing your kingdom come, that we would align ourselves to something so much bigger than ourselves, that we wouldn't be caught up in the day-to-day, -day, but we'd be caught up in seeing your kingdom come. I pray joy over every man, woman, child who's listening. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.